anyway, why is it that exercise might actually work in the brain? And this is one of the things that I'm also going to address briefly. Well, first of all, I'm not going to give you a review of the structure of the brain, just a few facts, a few reminders. Uh, this little device here consists of, roughly speaking, 125 billion neurons. Each of these got input from up to 5,000 other neurons and deliver output to up to 5,000 other neurons. So this is an incredibly complicated structure with a pattern of connectivity that goes almost beyond what you can imagine. How on earth do you construct such a thing? Well, one thing's for sure, you do not do so only by using your genes. Uh, because although the genetic code is able to provide a lot of information, it would actually theoretically not be able to specify that kind of connectivity. So a lot of the principles of building the brain is actually making a surplus and then getting rid of the things that do not work. So when you in development construct the brain, one of the basic principles is that there's an overproduction of neurons and then according to some guiding principles, uh, there are substances guiding the outgrowth of connex connections, etc. You create a connectivity pattern, but some of the neurons are not going to have uh, appropriate connections and those neurons then die. So you produce a surplus and you kill off those that do not work out neatly. Then you have a lot of synapses, a lot of connections created. The process already started, obviously, as I described, but you have even more of them. And that's the same principle. You produce a lot of them, and then actually quite a lot of them then are eliminated, those that are not appropriate. So a very basic principle of the brain is you make more than you need of something and you then sort it out and kill off those that are not appropriate. How does the brain know which connections to get rid of? How does it know which uh, brain cells to kill? Well, we do not know so in detail, and I'm going to spare you what we know because I could talk for hours about that one, but one of the things that is used in this connection is BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more about later on. The principle is that that factor and some of the other neurotrophic factors are substances that <laughs> promote the survival of the neurons and actually also promote the stability and survival of the connections of the synapses. Now, why is it that I start talking about that one? That is partly because when you get brain injury, you all of a sudden have an even greater need for brain-derived neurotrophic factor for BDNF. If you get stroke, uh, again, I could talk for hours about this, but the short version is you have a blockage of the blood supply, you have a dysfunction because uh, some of the energy demanding pro uh, processes in the neuron um, aren't working, the pumps that are going to keep the balance across the membrane are dysfunctional because of energy, a lack of energy and you have a hyper excitation of the neurons so they basically excite themselves, you have an input uh, that is too strong, it includes the neurotransmitter glutamate and includes a lot of influx of calcium into the cell. Now, you have in traumatic uh, brain injury, that's a simplified graph, and uh, I could spend the afternoon trying to work through this one, uh, then you would fall asleep, that's for sure. But anyway, again, in both instances, what you end up with would be, in many cases, an activation of a suicide mechanism within the cells. Uh, an influx, excessive influx of calcium will trigger something called Diabolo, which will inhibit some of those substances that can lead uh, to a blockage of apoptosis. So in other words, when you have that high influx of calcium, you actually trigger uh, a suicide mechanism in the neurons. So this means that when you get brain injury, a lot of the mechanisms are actually internal cellular suicide mechanisms. And another area in which these suicide mechanisms uh, will, we just skip that one for a moment, uh, will take place are in areas connected to the part of the brain injured originally. 
because one of the things that keep a cell alive is a, sub is a supply of these trophic factors. So if a cell has an appropriate connection to an appropriate region of the brain, it receives the neurotrophic factors, transports them back, and in the cell body, these factors will counteract a number of these processes. So in short, if you are in danger of triggering this kind of mechanism, then a way, at least partly, uh, to reduce that risk would be to have a reasonable supply of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Here's the guy, in case you meet it. Um, that's the portrait of the protein. And so, if you get brain injury, there's no way to prevent that injury from being there. If it's stroke, some cells would already have died by the time you encounter the first symptoms. If it's a tra traumatic brain injury, TBI, uh, you fall down the stairs, you're hit by a car, etc. Uh, of course, there is some mechanical injury to the brain. But the point is, this is only the first step. Regardless of whether this is stroke or mechanical injury to the brain, the process continues. Because now, some part of the brain is missing. And some other parts of the brain are now lacking the input from that part of the brain and lacking that part of the brain as their output zone. So other parts of the brain will actually suffer. The, mean, the consequence of this is that you now get secondary brain injury or even tertiary brain injury. You get a cascade of cells dying off. So in short, the story is not over by the time we, in traditional definition, would say, now brain injury is through. For instance, if I inflict mechanical brain injury uh, on a rat, I operate, I cut some fibers, or I remove a, a part of the cortex, one would say, well, when my assistant shows up, the animal, that's it. The brain injury is over. I've done mechanically what I want to do. Or the patient, when we dig the patient out of the wreckage of the car, uh, well, there may be a piece of metal sitting somewhere in the skull, uh, but we would say, okay, injury is over. Wrong. Injury just started. Some things are lost. No way to prevent that. But there is a cascade of things going on. There is a subsequent cascade of further growth, both within the vicinity and within other parts of the brain, of that brain injury. So, in short, what we can do after brain injury is reducing, potentially, the size of injury and, in other words, preserving what is left of the brain in the best possible manner. And since what we are doing when we rehabilitate the patient is actually reorganizing the rest of the brain, the more we can preserve, the better. And this is the good guy of the story, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, the previous speaker mentioned it briefly, talked about maybe applying uh, BDNF. There are some experiments in which BDNF has been injected into the brain, and of course it's a very tempting um, approach, saying, okay, if this is what is needed to keep the cells alive, and if the secondary and tertiary uh, damage to the brain is partly due to lack of BDNF, couldn't we inject it? Um, well, we can do it. Uh, the results so far have not been encouraging. Uh, it seems that externally applied BDNF, at least in the majority of the results so far, is not therapeutically very efficient. So it's not saying that BDNF is not the good guy, it's not saying it doesn't work, but it's saying that injecting it, applying it from the outside, might not be the best way of doing it. So how can we boost it?